Today I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the telecommunications agenda, kind of the, the big scheme of things uh, that we're dealing with across the street. And uh, uh, Peter mentioned my role as uh, chairman of the transition uh, under, under John Boehner. And I might just start with that because that sort of sets the stage for how things are playing out, uh, including yesterday uh, in the House. Um, you know, he called me about a week before the election. It was no secret by then that it looked like we would take the majority, but it's not something you go out and talk a lot about ahead of time. It looks like you're sort of counting your chickens before they're hatched. And uh, the awkward part for me was I, I always host the big uh, campaign party uh, in Southern Oregon, and it appeared if I were going to be the chairman of the transition team yet announced uh, and be ready to go to work Wednesday morning at 9, it's hard to get here from Medford, Oregon uh, overnight. <clears throat> So my wife and I uh, <coughs> had to cancel out of the Medford party, caused a little stir, you know, what's this deal? He got gotten big on us, you know, and uh, come back here, because I couldn't tell him what we thought was going to happen the next morning until John Boehner announced it. And so we got back here, and then they had me MC the uh, party back here. And uh, the next day, uh, or that night, uh, right after Boehner spoke, we went up to his apartment, or his uh, uh, hotel room, and uh, were able to Skype, using new technology, into uh, Medford, Oregon, and therefore he could announce uh, why I was back here. So we started the transition the next morning. By the way, there's uh, really nothing in the rules that allowed for that. Uh, I mean, we just made it up as we went along. Uh, I named it Transition Team. Uh, we created three task forces. We put 22 members on it. It's the biggest transition effort uh, uh, in modern history in the House. If you go back to 06, Mike Capuano did that work for Nancy Pelosi, and he was the Transition Team, one member. So I met with Mike, uh, said, what did you do right, what did you do wrong, what would you do if you could do it over? Um, we brought in Jim Nussel, who chaired the transition team in 94. Same questions, what did you do right, what did you do wrong, what advice and counsel do you have for us? We surveyed every member, Republican and Democrat, said, what works around here, what doesn't, what would you like to change? And, and more importantly, drawing upon a small business background, we surveyed all the, the key staff. You know, the, the, probably the most important person in your office is not your chief of staff, it's your scheduler um, and your office manager who puts up with everything else. So what would you do differently? What would you change? We got back hundreds of really good suggestions. We put a box up outside the office so that you put in anonymous suggestions, some of which would violate the indecency standard of the FCC, I can assure you. We were told what we could do with the transition effort. <clears throat> it's a remarkable period where uh, Ed Cassidy, you probably all know, uh, works for the speaker. He was coming around the corner. We were down in HC uh, 6 and 8, I think. And he was coming around the corner uh, about two days into this. I think it was about Thursday. And as he rounded the corner one way, Speaker Pelosi, who always went above and you know, did the press thing, hadn't made up her mind yet whether she was going to stay, go, run for whatever. She came around the corner the other way. and. Uh, my wife, who was helping set all this up, had, we typed up just on an 8.5 by 11 and stuffed in the little holder outside the door, you know, GOP transition team, Greg Walden, chairman. And honestly, God, she came around the corner the other way as Ed came one way, and she stopped with her whole entourage and turned and stared at that sign and then walked on. And you realized history had, had, uh, history had, had, had again changed. And then she went on to become Democrat leader. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> told I have that effect on people. Uh, let's talk about communications issues, uh, network neutrality. Look, uh, whether you're for it or against it, I don't believe FCC had the authority to do it. And that's the issue that we're raising with the FCC um, and going to take it uh, full on. February 16th, we'll have a hearing. All five commissioners will be before the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Com uh, Communications and Technology. Uh, we believe they, they lack that authority. I think most members of Congress indicated that in a letter uh, to the uh, FCC prior to their action. I think their process is flawed. I think they overreach, and they need reform. Um, and we're going to, uh, to bring that on. Uh, we will be offering a resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act. Uh, that requires a simple majority of both chambers and is a filibuster-proof action item in the Senate. Uh, but you have to introduce it within 60 days of the official FCC transmittal of the rules. However, the clock doesn't run the recess, and it's like if the Senate's in and the House isn't. I mean, it's only in Washington do you have a clock that only runs irregularly. <laughs> we will have a series of hearings involving the Federal Communications Commission on this issue and others. 
um, especially uh, related to their process and procedures. And this isn't necessarily to pick on this commission. I think that there is a string of commissions um, that have seemed to take on their own authority and not always worked well together and uh, maybe outside the authority of, of what the Congress has granted them and not as open as transparent as possible. One of the rules changes we put in place through the transition effort was to respond to the American public and say we're going to make the House more open, transparent, and accountable. It is the public's business, it is the taxpayer's money, and they should have the right to see what happens. We did that in the House. We're going to do that to these agencies over which we have jurisdiction. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to work the best of our ability to open up these processes. When you're getting 2,000 pages of response to a uh, rulemaking, and virtually nobody has time to read it at the Commission, and then you have a major rewrite of the rule itself only hours before it's, it's wrapped up, that's not a good way to do business. We've certainly done that here, and the public said stop it, and we're going to try and affect that on the agencies to get them to operate in a more open and transparent manner. We'll also be looking at broadband uh, beyond uh, everything else you hear. Uh, we think it's a great way to uh, uh, spur jobs, spur the economy, and raise billions for the Treasury if we um, look at uh, uh, things like auctioning the spectrum. Now, I know there's a big debate in this town over the D block, and there are some who think it should be given to public safety, and there are others who believe it should be auctioned off. Um, I'm in the category that believes it is the public's uh, uh, auction, it's the public spectrum, and it, it should be auctioned. Um, but we also recognize public safety has needs that we need to help them address as well. Understand that if this issue, if this spectrum is not auctioned, if it is given to uh, the public safety community, you open a three billion dollar wound in a rather uh, bleeding budget. And so you got a three billion dollar problem because that's the value of the auction, that's the value they per uh, perceive would be in the auction and uh, uh, that is something we'd have to make up because it's already been scored by CBO. Uh, so incentive auctions, uh, We'd, we'd look at incentive auctions, sharing proceeds from Spectrum, voluntarily returned from licensees. Commercial auctions, e block, we're going to look at return of the government Spectrum through reallocation and uh, more efficient use, taking into account national security. Spectrum's a really valuable commodity that the taxpayers own, and we're going to look to see who's using it, who's sitting on it, how we can uh, get uh, effective use of it recognizing you do have uh, rights there and having been a licensee for 22 years, I understand Spectrum, some of which we got in an auction, some of which are almost in an auction, the other guy dropped out, I never did understand that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's out there. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, the uh, USF, uh, the NT, uh, Universal Service Fund. I think there is bipartisan agreement that the fund is broken the way it's constructed. It is shooting up in terms of its cost. It is now at 8.8 .8 billion headed up per year, it continues to grow, and uh, currently amounts to about 15.5% surcharge on your long distance telephone bills and skews competition. The growth of the fund must be controlled and major reforms implemented to refocus it on serving areas where an economic case cannot be made for the private sector to do so. Uh, we're looking forward to working with the FCC to uh, getting this program back on sound fiscal footing. Uh, <coughs> broadband provisions and stimulus. As you know, they uh, rushed out the, the uh, so-called stimulus, and NTIA and RUS were allocated about $7 billion for broadband grants and loans, programs vulnerable, I think, to waste, fraud, and abuse, and the NTIA's oversight funding in the current uh, continuing resolution expires March 4th. When this was being debated in, in the Commerce Committee, uh, some of us uh, made a, a rather uh, uh, probably tiresome to others uh, argument that you're going to spend the money to build out broadband in areas before you have the mapping done to determine where the unserved and underserved areas are. By the way, that's going to be up on their website February 17th if they meet their deadline. The money went out the door by September 30th. Now, I, I had trouble with this when they were working through the timelines because it didn't make much sense to me to tell these agencies, get the money out the door, go serve underserved and unserved areas, and by the way, get the maps done that show where those are after you've spent the money. Uh, this is the, the, the illogic of, of how the stimulus bill moved through the Congress in many respects. So I think it's only prudent to do oversight of how that money was allocated, how it's been spent. And let's, let's just note 
um, that uh, we'll have a hearing on Thursday on this issue of uh, the inspector generals from uh, the, uh, the RUS and NTIA and the GAO all there to, to share their concerns. But understand the money's just gone out. So the, I wouldn't be looking for a huge smoking gun coming out of this hearing on Thursday, but I want to make sure there's the right oversight in place because the RUS in prior reviews has not always managed this program uh, effectively, shall we say, or prudently. And some of the recommended changes by GAO in the past, I think there were 14 of them, really took a long time to get implemented if they've been implemented at all or in total. And so uh, we're going to be looking very closely uh, again at this money. And we have legislation that says the money that <coughs> comes back, because not all of it will get spent, needs to go back to the Treasury. And so uh, that will be the focus of, of that hearing on Thursday. So in any case, it's great to be with you this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to share those comments on those topics. and I'd be